morning. How's everybody doing tonight? Welcome to the Saturday service. We're coming to you live from Turlock, California, from our home. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you tonight. And first of all, we would ask that you would remove me from behind this pulpit, Father God, and that you would replace me with your anointing Holy Spirit tonight. I pray for each and every single person that is listening, Father God, for every person that has tuned in. And I pray, Father God, that you would instill upon our hearts, Father God, the things that we cannot change. No matter how hard we try to manipulate a situation, to manipulate you, Father God, those are things that we just can't do. And so I pray tonight, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would take over this service, Father God, and that you would whisper into the ears of each and every single one of your servants, Father God, that each and every single one of us would come out just a little bit different than when we started tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Things we cannot change. For the first portion of scripture, I'd like you to turn to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 says this. For I am the Lord, I do not change. God does not change, no matter what. This world has a certain mindset on what kind of God they want. Amen? For example, they want a God that offers a lot of benefits, but doesn't require a lot of responsibility. They want a God who winks at sin. They want a God who says yes to all that they ask. They want a God who is not too demanding. And they want a God who punishes sin, but overlooks yours. They want a God who doesn't get in the way of their leisure and pleasure, but is there when we need him. Amen? Now, we might think that we are able to manipulate God or to use him at our pleasure and at our leisure whenever we feel like it. And we may not understand that sometimes that's exactly what we're doing when we'll only come running to him when we need something. Amen? Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. Amen? So what is the main point that we're talking about tonight? We're talking about we cannot change God. No matter how hard we try. Amen? And Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 says God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. So what is one of the things that we cannot change? God cannot lie. And so what do I want to tell you tonight? Is that when God makes you a promise, he's going to stand by that promise. When God tells you that he is going to change something, he's going to change something. And so when you find something in his word, especially when it pertains to your particular situation or circumstance, you can stand on that word knowing that God is not going to lie. God is not going to tell you something that's just going to make you feel good. God does not flatter you to make you feel better about yourself. When he tells you something, he's going to stand by it. He does not change. And his word does not change. His word has been the same since 2,000 plus years ago when it started being written. When the Holy Spirit prompted the prophets and those that came before us to write down the Holy Scriptures. Amen. God cannot lie. Numbers chapter 23 verse 19 says God is not human that he should lie. Not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I challenge you to answer those questions tonight. Because you will meet people in your lifetime that will say God did change his mind. 
He promised me this if I did this. Now notice what I just said. He promised me this if I did this. God does not change. So he will indeed do what he said he was going to do. But there was a prerequisite to what he said he was going to do. If you did this. Oftentimes we want to make it as if God is the one that failed. As if God is the one that changed his mind. As if God is the one that lied. But in all reality, we're the ones who dropped the ball. We're the ones that didn't follow through with the prerequisite. See, we like the benefit, but we don't want the responsibility. We like the benefit, we like the reward, but we would like try to obtain it without putting in the work. And it doesn't work that way. See, we can't manipulate God. You can't just go after all of the benefits without doing your part in obedience. Or maybe a better way of putting it, without loving him through your obedience. Amen? Does he speak and then not act? You will meet people in your lifetime that will say God has yet to fulfill his promise. Well, then that's where you need to understand that your thoughts are not his thoughts. Neither are your ways his ways. In other words, your timeline, your timetable of when you think things should take place is not going to be on his timeline. See, God is perfect. His timing is absolutely perfect. He may make you wait up to the very last second, but he always comes through. Amen? And you know what that develops within us? That develops patience. And it's something that we all need. We all need patience. And don't you understand that when you exercise that patience that God is developing inside of you, when you exercise that patience, you're also learning how to trust Him. And when you're learning how to trust Him, you're exercising that mustard seed size, uh, size faith that He has given unto you. And with that mustard seed size of faith, you are literally moving mountains. By moving those mountains, then you're removing obstacles in your life. If it's unbelief that you're mountain, well then you're moving it out of the way. You get what I'm saying? By totally trusting Him and understanding His timing and just putting things into His hands, then you don't have to be an impatient person. You can literally wake up in the morning and just remind yourself, God is working on my situation. God has already spoken and he will act. It's not up to my timing. It's up to his timing. But he will not fail me. Repeat that after me if you're still waiting for God to act on what he spoke. Say, God will not fail me. And believe it. And trust in what he told you. Amen. Does he promise and not fulfill? Or are there times that we don't follow through on the promise because we lacked the things that we were supposed to do on our part? I like to think of Moses as a good example. Did not get to enter into the promised land. There were several reasons why, but I'm going to remind you of one. Disobedience and blatant disrespect. Now, I'm not going to tell you where it is in the Bible because I don't know the exact address. But if you read the story of Moses, then you're going to understand that there was one day that the Israelites were thirsty. And Moses, like he usually did, he went to the Lord and he said, What shall I do for these people? They're mumbling, they're complaining, they're thirsty. They're saying you brought them out here in the desert so that they can die of thirst. And God said to him, Speak unto the rock and water will come out. But Moses, in his frustration, heard the instruction, but then added to it. He struck the rock twice. In frustration and anger. 
Very disrespectful. Number one, you weren't paying attention to what God said. God said, speak to the rock. He didn't even tell him how he had to speak to the rock. But all he had to say was something along the lines of, God said water will come out of that rock. Water, come out. And guess what? It would have gushed out. Wouldn't have been no disrespect. Wouldn't have been no complication. There wouldn't have been no misunderstanding. And perhaps Moses may have had a chance to enter into the promised land. But most people would like to probably think, and then maybe even Moses too, that God didn't fulfill his promise. But see, we've got things to do on our end as well. And we can't think that we just do one task and then we don't see it through. You see, because every step that we are taking towards that promise, we are learning another lesson in life. Valuable lessons that we need to learn. Things that we need to develop. Character traits inside of us. Amen? This is why we go through trials. This is why we go through tribulations. But see, people want a God that will say yes to all that we ask. People want a God that offers a lot of benefits but doesn't require all of the responsibility. People have that mindset that that's who God is. Amen? Does he promise and not fulfill? Not on his part. But we fall short every day, every minute, every second. Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 through 2. And the word of God says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. So even in the midst of you walking that path, the path that he has made level for the righteous, the way that he has made smooth for the righteous, you still have to maintain and not sin. You still have to have a level of holiness. Amen? It says it right here. Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. Nor his ear too dull to hear. If you've got frustration or you've got things that are going on in your life. Don't resort to things to try to remedy the situation. Some people go to alcohol. Some people pop a pill. Some people hit a pipe. Some people beat people. And others do other outrageous things that they try to do to calm themselves or to remedy their situation. And I'm here to tell you today, God's arm is not too short to save, nor is his ear too dull to hear. If you're going to talk to anybody about your situation, go to God first. Now, I'm not discouraging you from reaching out for advice from from your leaders or from a trusted brother or sister. But understand this. He never stopped listening. And he obviously knows when you go through stuff. Because he knows every detail of your life. So it's times like that. Where you should reach out to him. Because his arm doesn't become short during the time that you're developing this relationship with him. It's not that he forgets how to save you. It's not that he forgets how to hear you. It says it clearly right here in Isaiah 59. Your iniquities separate you from your God. You see, because he's holy and he's just. And if you are choosing to engage in things that he is totally against, things that contradict his word, now those are things that you are choosing to do apart from him. And apart from God, you can do what? How much? You can do nothing. So think about that. You alone are the one that's choosing to go off and try to maybe make this plan work a little bit faster. Maybe you're trying to reach the benefits and the rewards on your own timeline. In which case, there might be times that you are compromising. There might be times that you are telling little white lies. There might be things that you are doing that you know very well that God did not tell you to do. 
You know what I mean? Your iniquities separate you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you. Your relationship is no longer the same. See, because when you choose to indulge in sin, you are literally pushing the Holy Spirit away. All of his advice, everything that he tries to lead you in, you are basically saying, I've got it from here. I don't need you. Now, of course, you're not saying those words, but your actions are displaying it. And so he will not hear you. And it's not that he is, is the stubborn one. It's us that is the stubborn ones. It's us that chooses to do things in our own way. Like I said before, the path of the righteous is level. And the way of the righteous, God has made smooth. So if we just stay in step with him, if we remain on the path that he is leading us on, if we remain in the way, the truth, and the life, which is Jesus Christ, who does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if his image lives within us, then we should be imitating the same. We shouldn't be one person one day and a totally different person the next. We shouldn't have one goal one day and the next day all of a sudden become the most impatient people in the world. We cannot say to him in prayer, Lord, I'm with you till the wheels fall off. Until the very end, I want victory. And it sounds good. It sounds spiritual. But then all you've got to do is remain on the path. You don't go off and try to gain all of these things on your own. Because does he speak and then not act? And the answer is no. He speaks and it comes to pass. Does he promise and not fulfill? No, all his promises come to pass. The question is, are you ready to take on this journey that he is going to take you on? And the benefits of going on this journey is that all you're really doing is building a stronger relationship with him. See, he's already all in. We, on the other hand, start off with these baby steps as if we're scared and we don't know quite, you know, what we're going to get out of this. You know what I mean? We love the beneficial part of having our sins wiped away. We love being brand new. We love that no one's going to hold us to our past and the things that we did and that there's no consequences to that. You know what I mean? But then when it comes to building this relationship, we've got to be all ears. We've got to be all in. We've got to be participating actively in communication with our God. We've got to become people that follow and listen to instruction. We've got to become people that pay attention to detail. Amen? See, Moses, the only thing that he did wrong that day is that he did not make God's voice the most priority. Because even in your frustration, you can train yourself to really pay attention that when God said something, you're going to love him with all you have. You don't add to what he said. You don't subtract from what he says. Amen? So put yourself in Moses' situation that day. Even though the whole world was coming against him, he was so frustrated out of his mind but man, this man has seen God part the Red Sea. This man has seen God do miracle after miracle after miracle. And you mean to tell me that his circumstance and his situation was so loud that he couldn't hear the voice of God when he said, speak to that rock? You think you understand what I'm saying? He struck it, not once, but twice. God didn't tell him to strike it. He told him to speak to it. We've got to become people that pay attention to the details, especially when the creator of heaven and earth, the very one that formed you in the womb, 
When he speaks, we've got to be listening. We've got to pay attention to that detail. It's no different than when you're on the job site and your boss tells you, you know, you, you're probably one of those people that wants to know what you need to do to advance in the company, to get a promotion or to get a raise. What can I do? What are the steps to take? And being a boss, being a manager myself, I can tell you that I've answered that question many a times. Follow instruction. Listen to your leaders. Don't give them any heartache. Work in harmony with the team. We're all having the same goal in this company and that's to make sure that the client is totally satisfied. We don't want no injuries during the night. We want everybody to go back home safely the same way they came into work. We want everybody to work in harmony. We are a team. We are united. We're not divided. And we all have love for one another. All you got to do is listen and pay attention to detail. Be the most obedient person that you can be. And people want to do the opposite. They want to try to find loopholes and to try to get those promotions. So when they see the higher ups come onto the scene, I can speak from experience. They all flock to the people who have higher, higher titles than the person that's in charge. And so they'd rather go pitch their dream or their petition to that person. You know what I mean? Try to get it that way. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's something that you can't change. The wages of sin is life and death. And had it not been for Jesus, had he not went to that cross, had he not rose from the grave after on that third day, and had we not confessed him as our Lord and Savior, then we would still be responsible to pay that wage of sin and death. But he paid that price for us. He gave his very life. And our sins were wiped away. And the minute that you ask for forgiveness, there's that mercy. There's that grace. There's what we don't deserve. And he rightfully gives it to us. Amen? You can't change that. Another thing you cannot change is that God will not despise a broken and contrite heart. Psalm chapter 51 verse 17 says, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. Again, in your frustration, in the midst of your trial or your tribulation, not only is his arm not too short to save, not only is his ear dull to hear, amen? He can hear you and he wants to hear you, but he does not despise a broken and contrite heart. See, because that broken and contrite heart, when it's done right, will come right to the creator, will come right to the very one that can remedy your situation or give you the instruction to help you get out of it. The very one that can lead you right through the fire, right through the flooded waters, whatever you've gotten yourself into at this moment, at this point in time, I'm here to tell you tonight that he does not despise you. He is not going to chastise you because you made a mistake. You can literally come to him tonight and you can say, God, I made this huge mistake. And you can be broken. And you can have this heart that needs mending. And I'm here to tell you tonight. As he is in the mending business. He is in the rebuilding business. He is here to repair you. He is here to make you whole. To make you complete. And to see you through to the finish line. Hallelujah. Do you understand what I'm saying tonight? He does not despise a broken and a contrite heart. So when you're feeling this way or you're somebody that's watching right now and whatever tragedy has happened in your life in this past year, it has broken you. It has made your heart hard. Come to him. His arm is not too short to save and his ear is not too dull to hear. Not only is he waiting for you to reach out, 
but he's already working on the answer. Amen. Psalm 102, 17. He will respond to the prayer of the destitute. It means the desperate. Are you desperate tonight? He will not despise their plea. In other words, he's not one of those people that says, I hate beggars. Man, he wants you to love him. He wants you to cry out to him. He loves it when you reach out to him exclusively. When you go to him in prayer. And he loves it the more you repeat the more he loves to hear your voice. And he's ready and willing with open arms to help you, to rescue you. Amen? Psalm 138.6 Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. It don't matter how far you've drifted. It don't matter your, your statue in society. It doesn't matter whether you're high and mighty or whether you're one of the lowest of the low. I can tell you tonight that he's looking kindly upon you even now as we speak. He does not despise your plea. Amen? He sees you no matter how far you've drifted off. And he's looking from a distance just waiting for you with open arms to come running back to him. Are you ready to come running back to him tonight? Or perhaps you're somebody that has never ran to him. Perhaps you're somebody that's been trying to do things on your own for all of your life and you're tired. You don't want to admit you're tired. You've got this pride inside of you that says, I can do it on my own. Perhaps people in your life have let you down and so you felt like you had to carry it all alone. But I'm here to tell you tonight, Though you are tired, though you are hurting, that is what he's looking for. He's looking for you, and he wants to give you rest tonight. But you've got to admit that you need him. You've got to admit that you want him. And the way that you're going to show it is not so much in your words, but through your actions. Luke chapter 15, verse 10. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Are you that sinner tonight? Are you that person that the angels of God are going to rejoice over because you sought him tonight? Because you went to him and you pleaded to him, and he did not despise your plea? Is it you that they are going to rejoice over tonight? Because you finally put that pride aside, and you came to him, and you let it all out. There's somebody watching right here, right now, tonight. You've been holding on to this bitterness inside of you. You've been holding on because you don't understand why God put you through the things that you've been going through this year. Perhaps it was one huge tragedy. Whatever the case was, you've got this anger inside of you. You've got this bitterness. And you put on this facade, this mask, as if everything's going to be okay. And it's praise God and it's hallelujah. But deep down inside, you're mad at the Lord. And I'm here to tell you tonight, He does not despise you. I'm here to tell you tonight that he is looking upon your loneliness. He is looking at your anger and he can see your frustration and he knows exactly what you've been through. And he is waiting with open arms to comfort you, to be with you, to restore you, to rebuild you, to repair you. Amen. The last thing I want to leave with you tonight, well, second to last, is that God's word cannot be broken. Psalm 12, 6 says, and the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. God's word cannot be broken. God's word cannot be broken. Repeat it with me. Write it down if you're taking notes. God's word cannot be broken. Psalm 119, 89. Your word, Lord, is eternal. That means it's forever, guys. It stands firm in the heavens. And I'm here to tell you tonight that it stands firm within our hearts and within our minds. You just got to be patient. Case in point. I've got to give God glory. I've got to thank him right here, right now, publicly. Though in my heart I had purpose that I did not deserve to have a child of my own. 
from my own seed. And I had purposed in my heart and I had accepted that God was not going to bless me in that way. And I could tell you tonight, if you've been watching closely about our lives, if you've been watching the videos that we've been posting, if you've been following our testimony for the past 12, 13 years, then you will know how badly the desire of our heart was to have a child of our own. And so we praised God when God gave us Joseph. And we praised God when God brought Brianna Alley. But now we're even more in awe of the Lord because of Bailey Grace. And that's our daughter that's going to be born March 1st. You see, God's word never returns back void. Brothers and sisters, his word is never flawless. I've been told repeatedly that God was going to bless us in this way. I've read in his word that he blesses the obedient. He blesses the seed of their body. I always had started, I had started to honestly think that maybe for whatever reason I didn't deserve that. And so the day that I found out that my wife was pregnant, I literally cried inside the vehicle because, because of COVID, I couldn't go in there with her. But when she called me and she said, there's a heartbeat, man, I started crying before the Lord. And I said, Lord, I had already purposed in my heart that, that I didn't deserve that type of blessing for you, from you. And you know what he told me? He said, because you have delighted yourself in me, I am giving you the desire of your heart. And what a lot of people don't know about me, something that I probably never disclosed, is that I wanted a baby girl. I really did. I, I, I just want a little girl that says, that's my daddy. You know what I mean? I want my daddy's little girl. And so when everybody was guessing what the baby's gender was going to be, and man, we had fun posting it and doing all that kind of stuff, but in my heart... I had already purposed once again and said, Lord, I, and I don't even deserve for you to give me that. Even if it's a boy, I'm going to rejoice. I'm, I'm, I'm praising you either way, Lord. And what was the gender? A baby girl. See, God knows the desires of our heart. But we've got to do our part. We've got to delight ourselves in Him. Amen? You see, people are quick to try to say, you know what, God failed me. No, he didn't fail you. 14 years later, that promise came to pass. It wasn't my timing, it was his. He decided when. He decided where. And he decided how he was going to bring that news to us. Amen? Wonderful testimony. But see, that's why you can't deny what I'm teaching you here tonight. We cannot manipulate God. We cannot change God. And we certainly can't change his word. All you've got to do is find it in his word. But see, you've got to get in there and you've got to find it. You've got to read it and you've got to hold on to it. And then you've got to trust and you've got to believe. You've got to trust and believe so much that you go out and do what his word says. Delight yourself in him and he will give you the desires of your heart. Amen. But don't leave out the delightful part. How will he know you're delighting yourself in him when you will gladly get up at 3 o'clock in the morning when he says, I want you to pray for this person. When he says, I need you to go to so-and-so's house. I need you to volunteer to serve food for the homeless. I need you to do this. I need you to do that. Delight yourself in him. Don't get up like it's a chore. Oh, here I go. I got to go do ministry. Delight yourself. Be happy that God wants to use you. Be happy that you were in a position of authority. That God said you are the one that's going to speak to the brokenhearted. Amen? God's word cannot be broken. And the last thing I want to leave you with tonight is that God cannot stop loving you. You can't change that no matter how hard you try. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. Romans chapter 8 verses 38 through 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, 
nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God loves you with an everlasting love and you cannot change that. No matter how many times you mess up, no matter how mad you've gotten at him this year through your trial, through your tribulation, no matter how much you try to blame him, maybe you're even cussing him out at times, but I'm here to tell you tonight, nothing you do is going to change how much he loves you. Amen? He loves you with an everlasting love, and he draws you with his unfailing kindness. Perhaps you've been pushing him away. Perhaps you've been saying, I don't want your kindness, and today is your day. I want you to stand up with me if you're watching. I want you to stand up. I want you to shake yourself off a little bit, and literally... If you've repented for the way that you've been acting towards the Lord, if you've asked the Lord to forgive you, then today is a day of salvation. Your path has been made level. Your way has been made smooth. Amen. And now it's time to dance. here tonight one thing you can change is how awesome and powerful our God is on behalf of my wife myself my son Frankie my son Joseph my daughter Brianna Alley and our newborn that's ready to come Bailey Grace we thank you for joining us here in Turlock California we thank you for joining us here on Saturday night God bless each and every single one of you we love you and see you next week Bye.